Right. I'll just double check that we're live uh, on the YouTubes, but we should be. View video stream. Yes, we are. Okay. So, welcome everybody. Uh, and for our next talk, we've got uh, Henny Swan, my colleague here at TPG. Uh, Henny is a, a user experience and design lead here at TPG, and she's going to uh, launch and introduce us to the Inclusive Design Principles project that she's been working on. So take it away, Henny. Thanks, Pat. And good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. I hope you're not all feeling too sleepy. I know I'm a little bit. I've listened to some amazing talks today. Um, full disclaimer. I live in Brighton on the south coast of the UK. We have enormous seagulls and they are um, they, they have a tendency to flash mob me when I'm doing presentations or I'm on call. So I, I'm really hoping we're not going to get too much seagull noise this morning. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you about uh, some inclusive design principles that we've been uh, evolving in-house. And, and while I'll be doing the talking, this is actually me representing a few of us at TPG who've been writing these principles, namely Ian Pouncey, Hayden Pickering and, and Leonie Watson. Um, and, it's, and it's not really just us, it's, it's we've, we've, we've been working on projects within TPG or prior to TPG. And this is kind of like a, a sort of our collective experiences and understandings of working with clients and with people on their products to try and put together a, sort of a framework, really, in which to uh, think about how we approach inclusive design. Behind every great site or application lies thought, empathy and inclusion. Now, this doesn't happen by accident. It happens by design. So we have the web content accessibility guidelines and, and other guidelines which, which we need and are the foundation of building uh, accessible websites and um, applications. However, uh, there's, there's not a huge amount within WCAG that covers design. And I think, um, you know, other than things like providing good color contrast and, and visible focus states, you know, things like that. And WCAG has actually got uh, something of a bad press because people say, oh, it doesn't really cover de design sufficiently, um, it's left out, etc. But I think that's probably a little bit unjust because design is subjective. Uh, it changes de depending on the context within which you're designing for. So not only the platform, but the product, the people who are going to use it and how they're going to be using it. So it's not really something that you can distill particularly easily into a set of guidelines. And this is why we're using these inclusive design principles. They're here to help us um, formulate our thinking when we're working on client projects and, and to help guide our, our, our thought processes as opposed to kind of come up with a checklist of things that we need to be doing uh, when designing. So the, the principles are not here to tell you what to do or how to do it, but simply to spotlight pathways uh, to help identify how to best shape your uh, websites and products. So as Steve Jobs said, design is not just what it looks and feels like, design is how it works. And he's spot on here because how we design or to directly impact how it, a website or application will be coded down the line. So good design will naturally lend itself to a, a more accessible and inclusive site, whereas bad design won't. And it was quite interesting. Yesterday, I, I, I tweeted and I asked within TPG if anybody had any good examples of um, of uh, good context sensitive help, the uh, accessible context sensitive help. And the response I received was absolutely zero, zilch, complete tumbleweed, apart from one lone tweet, which was from Pat Twit, who said, uh, sorry, I can't share that with you because when you have accessible and inclusive context sensitive help, you're not even aware it's there. It's, it's just seamless. And that really, for me, points back to what Steve Krug said, which is don't make me think, which again, time and time and again, we come back to in presentations and when working with clients. But what I think has really happened over the years is while 
many people think about that, like don't make the user think, we're not actually including disabled users in that process. We're not thinking about how actually are we making disabled users having to work that little bit more harder to use our websites um, and our application than we are other people. And that's really the crux of it. We, we don't want to put the onerous on um, the disabled user. We want to make things easier to use. Jared Smith uh, put this extremely well. I love this article um, called Lipstick on a Usability Pig when he said, applying accessibility techniques to an unusable site is like putting lipstick on a pig. No matter how much you apply it, it will always be a pig. And I think he's spot on. Because if the design is broken, you're gonna come up with a site um, that, that doesn't work particularly well. And it's not gonna work for all users, let alone disabled users. It, you know, we do a lot of remediation in our business and within our company. And it's very rare that I'll turn around and I'll say, sorry, we cannot make that accessible. Normally there's a way to, to you know, to tweak the code, to make things better. Um, but occasionally you get a design which is just so not, not correct that you have to come up with something which is really quite hacky and a little bit of a band-aid. And at that point, that's the tipping point at which you start to make something potentially uh, accessible, but you, it might be just so kind of messy that it becomes unusable. And I've seen so many websites which are informant, but actually they, the, some of the design just doesn't work for everybody. And the knock on effect is it introduces uh, accessibility issues for, for people um, with different types of needs. So let's jump into our first principle. Consider situation. People use your interface in different situations. Make sure your interface delivers a valuable experience to people regardless of their circumstances. Now, this is quite interesting. I, I, I talk a lot with design teams, people, developers, and quite often when people are talking about accessibility and how to make things more uh, accessible and inclusive for disabled people, they, they talk about people as blind people, screen reader users, voice input users, uh, people with Zoom texts. Um, they're not actually, we're not actually framing our products in the context of, these are people who, in fact, might be first time users, repeat users. They might be somebody who sat in front of a computer at work. They might be somebody who's out and about with a mobile or sitting on a sofa with a laptop with lots of screaming kids around them. So people are people and, and we need to. People by their disability, but actually start thinking about how disability might impact or the situation might impact on dis in disability. So. Let's look at captions on the go. So in the last few years, uh, captions have suddenly kind of picked up pace. Uh, caption subtitles in the UK, people are including them much more in their content for many different reasons. Uh, but one of those would be that we are consuming much more content uh, in video is on mobile when we're out and about. And of course, we don't want to have the sound up. We don't want to be antisocial. And so providers are catching on to this and having captions enabled by default. Classic example being Facebook. And uh, rather fortunately, I was looking through Facebook yesterday to go and get an example. And I happened to scroll down and find this video of America's Got Talent, which happened to be of a deaf lady who went on to perform and brought her sign language interpreter with her. And the screen grab I have is of Simon Cow asking her, are you deaf? And there it is in captions. I think this is a very good example of how actually goes beyond just including people with disabilities, so deaf and hard of hearing, but also people who um, are have maybe have situational limitations. In 2015, the Office of Communications here in the UK produced um, so, uh, carried out a survey to see how many people were using subtitles, closed captions. And of the amount of people that were surveyed, 84% said they used closed caption subtitles, which is, you know, exponentially high. So that backs up the data that, that so many people are using captions. You know, you might be second screening, you might be looking at something at night, you may be in the office, you might be on the train, for example. Going back to thinking about uh, the people who use your products and are not defining people by their disability. 
let's imagine a scenario where you might be doing your weekly shop, sitting on a bench at a train station, and it's very sunny, and you've got glare on your on your phone, and you happen to be low vision as well. So challenges you have anyway, you've got further challenges layered onto it because of your location and environment and what's going on. So it's important to think about what your users will be doing and where they'll be doing it when they access your products. Next up, we have uh, prioritized content. Focus on core tasks, features, and information by prioritizing them within your content and layout. So this is kind of a no-brainer, really. You can look at this principle and go, well, this applies to everybody, and this is what we do. We try and prioritize our content all the time. But I think there are subtleties that perhaps do get overlooked when it, when we don't think about the different types of people who are, who are using our products who might have access needs. So on screen, I have a screen grab of a, uh, a website in the UK called Channel 5. It's a broadcast website, so you can go there and watch Catch Up TV or find out about programs, etc. The screen grab was taken on my laptop, um, taking up the full screen of the laptop. And what you can see on full screen is a uh, top, a massive banner ad, um, a main menu, which has only got sort of five links in it, and then a, an image below that peeps up above the fold, which quite honestly, I don't really know what it is. It doesn't really give me much um, information about what it could be. Uh, as a user, as somebody who's looking at something in my browser at, at, at sort of normal Zoom, if you will, uh, I have to work a little bit to figure out how to get to the TV show that I want to watch. I have to jump around and work a bit. I have to scroll down, etc. But if you're using Zoom text and you have everything scaled up to say 300%, you're first forced to work so much harder and the site becomes sort of, you know, your, your efficiency of getting to the, to the content you want is diminished considerably. So what you see on screen now is that white strip at the top has now taken up a third of the screen and then the rest of the screen is taken up by a banner ad, which is really, about six months ago, I was on this site and I was browsing with Zoom text and I selected a, some, some cops and robbers show to watch, I can't remember, downloaded. Uh, the playback page loaded and this video suddenly played and it was a chocolate ad that then stopped and nothing happened and i thought what's going on this is not you know whatever cop show it was and what had happened is with zoom text everything magnified the video was at the top i'd inadvertently moused over it and it took up the screen and pushed this advert at me but because i was expecting playback of something that i'd selected I was none the wiser as to what had happened. So the, prior, the prioritized content had completely been lost. Prioritizing content also comes under how you might structure things as well. So we use headings so you can visually scan and get to things quickly and find where you want to go. Headings are also very important to provide semantic information to screen readers so that people who use screen readers can quickly navigate to key parts of the page that they might want to navigate to. So far, so good. So on screen, I have a picture of the BBC News website, which is a pretty, bit, pretty busy page. It has a number of visual headings, so Corbyn, foreign policy must reduce a threat. This is uh, followed by a, a short abstract, some information about the article, some related links, and uh, a picture. Other articles have the article name, an abstract, and some thumbnails. Uh, other articles have literally just uh, the article name and the thumbnail. So this is quite a busy page. It's got a lot of content on it. Um, when I go with a screen reader, we start to feel how really immensely busy this page is. So on screen now, I have a video playing of um, voiceover. The same page, I have voiceover navigating through the headings and you can see the heading dialog box. And what happens is, is we're navigating through over 60 headings. Almost all of the page is marked up as a heading. Really problematic from a user experience perspective because headings are there to get you to prior content, 
quickly and efficiently. If you have a lot of headings in the page, you start to really kind of, well, they start to lose their usefulness, really. They start to kind of prevent you being able to quickly get to where you want to go. So there's a snippet on screen that I've taken from the news page uh, of the must see section. And in it, you know, must see is a fixed heading of H2 and then you've got H3s below it. Now, there's a number of H3s here and a few of them are coded around just the article title, which sits below the thumbnail. That to me is not a heading at all. That to me is um, uh, part of a list, really to be coded up as a list and if we were to start moving these things into a list we will then the heading structure will start to become more clear and apparent and useful for people who aren't using a screen reader and one thing that i like to advise and again this is not a, a compliance thing but a user experience thing is if you have a busy website that has lots of content that updates daily hourly then think about your structure and having the, the second level headings as text that doesn't change. So local news, world news, that's fixed. And things that do change quite frequently, consider putting those into lists if lists make semantic sense. But again, it will all depend on context. Next up, we have be consistent. Be consistent with conventions and their application throughout your interface. Now, consistency is all about familiar, familiarity. And what we want to do is, is build on what people already know in terms of how they interact with the web. So again, it goes to this, don't make me think. Um, the web is a very complex place and we have very complex components such as tab panels, date pickers, the whole lot frequently across the web but what we really want to be doing is making sure that the um, that these things are used uh, are built consistently and in a familiar way so that as a user coming to your site using a keyboard I can expect to be able to navigate around the tab panel in the same way that I did in a previous site and these this is where with design teams I point them to a technical spec the way ARIA authoring practices, which basically outlines what the keyboard behavior, focus management, um, interaction, and the, 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 the screen reader output should be for these complex interactions. And while it is a technical spec and it is something that is more directed at the developer, I think it is very important when we're designing components and thinking about features, whether they are custom or, or standard, we need to be using the same understanding of how people can navigate and interact with them. So the important thing here is to be consistent with design patterns which are out there on the web, but also to make sure that you use these design patterns consistently across your website. Um, a few years ago, I worked at BBC and we had um, uh, many of the different products would have massive homepage carousels but each of them were built by different teams and each of them had different keyboard interaction they had different wording for the next previous buttons etc so we had this design pattern that was really quite heavily used and on index pages of, of, of you know news iPlayer etc but they were all inconsistently uh, implemented which Again, it just makes people have to work that little bit harder when they're moving from one place to the next. Additionally, we have used consistent editorial, including text alternatives used across platforms. So I think we're all uh, aware that we need to be consistent with how our editorial is presented. Um, you know, we always make sure that we have copy that, that, that is, is similar across different products, etc. However, something that is, I feel, very much overlooked is we don't think about the editorial that's being used uh, by uh, screen reader users, for, for example. That is a massive oversight because what's really important there is if I'm f familiar with using a website um, on my desktop and listening to the alternatives for buttons, uh, for links and navigation, it's really helpful for me if uh, when I listen to that same website on um, uh, Android or iOS, that the editorial is the same. It makes me feel like I'm in a familiar environment. It makes me feel like I know what I'm doing. It makes me confident that if I press this, you know, uh, activate this button or link, that I'm going to go to the place that I want. 
the other layer that you get within that for free is you get a kind of a degree of um, audio look and feel, if you will, or, or even you could say some kind of branding, you know, the product is recognizably your product and that reinforces it with, uh, with, with the end user, with the screen reader user. One exercise I did at uh, BBC was working on iPlayer responsive, iOS and Android. These three things were all being worked on and relaunched at the same time. And I had an exercise where I went and harmonized all the text alternatives for buttons on, on that, that were replicated across all of those uh, all of those properties. And we then went on to do a very interesting project where we assessed the text alternatives for next previous buttons, show hide buttons, hidden text, text alternatives for um, links, etc that were used for key navigation across uh, a number of key uh, BBC products. And then we sifted this down to come up with what we what we thought would be best practice. So again, you have consistent editorial for people who can't, can't see um, the, the, the screen. Next up, we have offer choice. Consider providing different ways for people to comp complete tasks, especially those that are complex or non-standard. Now, it's important to highlight here that we all have different needs and sometimes we cannot access things in one way, but we can access it in the other. But regardless of your needs, you should also be able to have a preference. And that's something that I don't think um, that we do particularly well. We don't give our disabled users a choice or a preference when they're using our products as to how they might want to interact with something. Um, it, it's a bit like uh, if you've seen children play and you get this dominant child and they got all these toys and they give the less dominant child one toy and say, you have that one, it's the best one. But actually, is, is that the, the toy that that kid really wants to play with? So we can't make assumptions that people want to use our, thing, our, our products in a certain way. A great example of this is on, um, you know, touchscreen devices. So looking at the mail app in iOS on screen now, well, it, this is uh, this is great on a number of levels, actually, because it offers choice in a number of different ways. So number one, uh, gestures. So if you have a list of uh, items in your inbox, you can either swipe to uh, activate an action like delete or flag or go into the more menu, or you can tap to go into the item and where you can get all those um, controls as well. Or you can go into edit mode and you can select to delete or flag things. What's great about this is, um, you know, we're all different and somebody who has uh, sort of issues of dexterity is going to be very different from another person who has issues of dexterity. Some people find it easy to swipe. Some people find it easier to tap. I know my mother-in-law and my daughter are very similar. They're, they're at the opposite ends of the age spectrum. So, um, so when my daughter was four, uh, my mother, my mother-in-law was seventy five I think now but when it came to buttons on touch screens they thought they were like buttons in the real world and would be pressing down incredibly hard and deleting all the apps on my on my iPhone um, and swiping was a bit easier say for Patricia my, my mother-in-law so what you're doing now is accommodating people with de different dexterity needs the other thing we have is swipe to delete is a standard gesture but not everybody knows about it because there's no visual affordance. This is where, as a screen reader user, you get more, it, apps can be actually a lot more easier to use because it, as you go onto an item, it will tell you swipe to activate actions, et cetera. But visually, there's no actual affordance to let you know that you can do that. I'm gonna come back to choice a little bit in control, which is our next principle sure people always have control over content and presentation. People should be able to access and interact with content in their preferred way. So as much as you want to give control, you do not want to take control away. So mobile, again, is a great example of this. Uh, lots, of, lots of features that enable access uh, and lots of kind of different settings that people can use. So here on screen, I have um, a small friend of mine called Sam, who I think he was probably around about four years old at the time. Now, um, Sam was uh, injured in a car accident and was paralyzed from the neck down. He didn't have any head movement, but was able to speak. We, sadly, we lost him now. And um, 
and could use a sit puff device. And, and, and here he is sitting in his wheelchair and he has the sit puff device in front of him. And what you're not seeing off screen is, is his tablet, which is fixed onto the front of his, uh, of his wheelchair. Now for Sam, he has it fixed in, let's say he has it fixed in uh, portrait mode. If your app forces uh, users into landscape mode, that's it, game over. Sam can't access it. Now, this isn't part of um, any set of guidance. It's not part of any set of, of guidelines yet, um, but it, it literally prevents him from accessing your app. You get lots of uh, TV apps which do exactly that. They make the assumption that you want to look in landscape, but actually that's not always the case. So you need to ensure that people have control um, to, to use things in certain ways. Another great example of this is autoplay. So I should qualify what I mean by autoplay because it means lots of different things depending on context. So in this, this context, I'm actually talking about uh, content that autoplays when, when one, media, one video stops, it, it continues. So it's kind of like continuous play. Uh, the other autoplay, of course, is when you download a page and video automatically plays. Now, it plays when a page downloads. We're all up in arms saying, well, we can't do this because it's bad for screen reader users. It drowns out their noise. However, again, it comes down to situation and context and giving people the, ch uh, the choice and the ability to control what's going on. I spoke to two users at uh, BBC who on iPlayer, they would go and pick out a program to watch as their screen reader users. They'd hit the link go to the page and really what they wanted was for the video to just play. But instead they had to navigate the page, find the media player, find the play button and hit play. To that, to them, that wasn't particularly efficient. That was just a whole bunch of other steps really. You know, once you've made a decision, you just want to watch. That was great users of iPlayer, but for someone who hasn't used it before, uh, that's going to be completely throwing them through a loop. So again, you need to provide opt-in and opt-out uh, and, and choices on how to control content. So on screen, I've got BBC News. Uh, what you have is a persistent button, on which is uh, together with the player controls, appears with the player controls, autoplay on and off at any point. Uh, throughout playback so you can you can change your mind whenever you want so it's not buried deep down in preferences it's there right up front and what's really good is that they provide a choice in how you control autoplay as well because as well as having it as a button on screen you also have it towards the end of a video playing in a countdown so you can absolutely you know it and get out of it if you need to get out of it quickly so choice and control working well together there a lot of um, a lot of great stuff happening in accessible gaming and we've got a few presentations today um, and this was an example shared with me by Ian Hamilton who has done amazing work in accessible gaming raising the profile etc and he, he shared this this is from a game called Killer Instinct and it's the settings screen has uh, a number of controls where you can control different audio levels for announcer type, announcer volume, sound effects, really important, music, vocals and ambience. And then you've got um, a HUD meter volume control which allows you to, um, to, to change the volume on an element in the game that goes up and down, which you wouldn't necessarily be able to see, and whether you want to have it louder or, or quieter. So that was put in specifically for people who are blind, but I can imagine that would be something that um, a few people would want to use. Next up, we have provide a comparable experience. Ensure your interface provides a comparable experience for all users so people can accomplish tasks in a way that suits their needs without undermining the quality of the content. So many interesting conversations when we were talking about this one, when we were kicking around what this really meant. Originally, we, we talked about um, calling it provide an equivalent experience. But it, there was a lot of sort of thought provoking really around the fact that can can we really provide equivalent experiences? I mean, this is a talk within itself. If you are blind, 
and you are um, accessing audio description, can that really ever be equivalent to actually seeing the, 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 the movie that's playing? You know, you, there's great audio description out there. I think Net, Netflix is actually absolutely kicking it with their audio description. I have it switched on when I'm cooking and I love it because it's it's short, succinct, and it tells me exactly what I need without any other fluff. And it's, it's a really good experience. But ultimately, it's being able for me to turn around and look at the laptop when something happens. The same with subtitles and closed captions. We can do all sorts of magic to make them look very, you know, beautiful, easy to read and, and, and color coding, etc. But is it really the same as being able to sort of hear the tone of voice that, that that's coming through um, and, and to, and to uh, sort of hear the ambient music? Lots of things that you can do uh, to, to make subtitles uh, more inclusive. So it's uh, WCAG you need to one have subtitles closed captions and two they need to be synchronized uh, with the video which means that the text needs to appear on the screen at the same time that that things are being said if you have those two things in place then you are compliant which is great but actually uh, that's really a fist of how we can make these experiences much much better so on screen i have uh, a screen grab of uh, a, I'm not sure what it is actually, I think it might be casualty, and it shows two people talking to each other and the top says you don't want people to find out in green and the bottom line says there's nothing to find out in white, indicating that we have two different people speaking and this goes back to that Steve Krug thing of don't make me think because I look at that and I know that two people, two different people are saying something rather than reading that and thinking, oh, I don't know, is that one person saying something or two people saying something? I've got so used to looking at color-coded captions now, I use, I use closed captions all the time, that I find it really hard work to go back to using captions that are not color-coded. So another thing is really around sort of <sighs> decorative images and whether, or, or the, whether they should or should not have um, alt text. I'm sure you've all come across scenarios or been part of a discussion where you put 10 accessibility specialists in a room and, and you say, should uh, decorative images have alt text? And you'll probably get maybe 25 different answers. Um, it's always open to debate and it's always down to context, but it is, is always down to the user as well. Uh, a logo, if you will, for the inclusive design principles which are uh, really three hot air balloons hanging together in a calm, sunny sky. And that's what we've used as our alt text, not a literal description, because the literal description would be three hot air balloon, balloons, one in the foreground is larger, two in the background is smaller, with a cloud behind and the sun peeping out from behind that. So you could get very literary about it and write it nicely, but, but would that really convey what we're trying to convey in terms of look and feel? this logo we wanted something that was was happy uplifting uh, calm and and inclusive and felt made, made you feel like you could be part of something something fun and interesting and leone said uh, uh, i used to have sight so i appreciate descriptive alt text on decorative images and that's her experience that makes sense there may be other people who would prefer not to have decorative alt text because they want to be much more focused in on the content so again when you're thinking about these things you need to think about the context of use um, what it might bring to the page you don't want to use it as like a really heavy-handed branding exercise because i just think that would be awful it's like having flashing banner ads everywhere but it's something that you might want to consider in terms of trying to convey a little bit of the sort of the, the look and feel of the site on a slightly larger scale um this is a picture of brighton pavilion uh, which is just down the road where i live in brighton this was a, a completely over the top maharaja style palace that was built a couple of hundred years ago by the prince regent who got kicked out of the court of the king's court for basically being a naughty boy um, so he came down to Brighton and built himself a party palace and Brighton hasn't looked back since. Um, and it's, it's absolutely phenomenal inside. It, it's, it's just got all this. It's very famous for sh it's chinoise decoration. It's super ornate, incredibly over the top and absolutely gorgeous. 
And a couple of friends came to visit last summer, uh, Victor and Caro, and, and Victor is blind and, and Caro has low vision. They went to have a look around the pavilion and I met them for lunch afterwards. And they told me about walking around. So they, they, they buy their tickets and they get an audio guide and they start walking around the pavilion and, and quite quickly said, this isn't really working for me. Um, I, this audio guide is not particularly informative for me. But for Caro, it was, it was slightly different because she has some sight and she's, she's an incredibly um, colourful visual person is read you out a, a short snippet from uh, the audio guide. Now this is a snippet that's about what happened to the pavilion during the Second World War when it was taken over and used as a temporary hospital. It would be difficult today to visualise the building as it looked a hundred years ago, but as we follow the tour, imagine the rooms with their royal furniture and ornaments removed and with lino covering the floors and boards protecting the, window, the, the walls you'll have the opportunity to see photographs of the pavilion during its time as a hospital throughout the tour. Quickly, we can see that this alternative format is not a one size fits all. It's quite descriptive. It's pointing out what you can look at. It's telling you you can see photographs of the wall, but what if you don't know what the wall looks like or, uh, or even how a photograph might, might be rendered, etc. So very, very visual. Now they return their guides to um, the front desk and actually somebody showed them around the building and they're completely set up to have people guide people around the building and explain it and they got taken sort of behind the velvet rope they were allowed to touch things they were told stories etc so the stories really brought the whole pavilion to life and interestingly if you listen to the children's audio guide they heavily rely on stories to try and communicate what the pavilion is like and that was one thing that that, that victor said to me he was like i wanted stories i wanted to hear about what went on not have things described that I couldn't see. So our final principle is add value. This is, this is, I shouldn't really have favourites, I'm not sure if I do, but this for me is a really, really important, um, important principle and is one that uh, you should be, so I would say, introducing before you've even started to work on your designs. This is when you're you know, coming out with concepts and ideas about what your product, what shape your product might, might take and what types of features you might need in order to meet uh, the requirements of the business. So adding value, consider the value of features and how they improve the experience for different users. Now, you can ar argue that features add value for all users, but I would say to you that some features add particular value for disabled users. We live in a, a, you know, a really interesting time of Internet of Things, Web of Things, connectivity with devices and our environment around us. And uh, all of this can be done from a mobile phone. So is, you know, whatever mobile device you're using is going to be your accessible device of choice. So, you, you know, you have all your tools, you have all your, your screen readers or Zoom enabled and set up in the way that you want. A good example is something called Chromecast. So Chromecast is a dongle. You can just move your TV into your internet-enabled TV. And what it allows you to do is for an application that has Chromecast enabled, so YouTube, for example, you can navigate within the app on your phone, find what you want to watch, and then you can send it to your TV. You can cast it to your TV. A massive value added feature for so many different types of disabled user. Number one, remote controls, incredibly difficult to use and quite frankly, they're down the back of the sofa half the time anyway, or your kids put it in the freezer or something. So you can never find it. Um, but equally, if I've got low vision, I can't read the programming guide when I pull it up on the TV without walking up to the TV. But if I can read it on my device, zoom me. Equally, um, having uh, speech enabled TVs and set top boxes is, is quite a pricey endeavor. So being able to use your device, which has you know set up as you want it and working for you as you want it is just brilliant. And also tip to parents, if you're in a different room and your kids watching TV, you can also. <laughs> um, other things that we have in mobile devices, think about all the APIs. Uh, 
so many different ones, um, voice API, camera API, vibration API, touch ID, all of these uh, allow us to kind of bypass uh, steps in navigation that can be quite cumbersome, that are not particularly efficient for us as users. So think about the voice API, which I have a screenshot of on the left, uses the voice API. This allows, if, if, you're, if you have dexterity issues and you find the on-screen keyboard difficult to use, brilliant activate the voice API. The same if you can't spell. I'm a terrible speller to the point where even predictive help just throws its hands up at me and walks off. So be able to use the voice uh, Voice search is a really, really big, big godsend. Um, equally, the camera API. So Amazon does great work in integrating with the camera API and voice API. So think about Amazon Pantry you've run out of milk, all you need to do is, is wave your phone around if you can't see and find the scan, uh, the barcode, and you can scan it, and then you've, you've done your shop. Much easier than sitting down, opening the app, and faffing around, trying to get to um, a bottle of milk in, in Amazon Pantry. The same for Touch ID, and again, bypassing difficulties that you may have with inputting data, inputting um, data with the keyboard. Using a Touch ID is great, especially when you have complex uh, security and sign-in, which can be very, very off-putting if you have cognitive or learning difficulties. The point with all these, though, however, is there are people who will not be able to use the voice API, so people who don't have speech, who will not be able to use the camera API, or people with dexterity issues who can't use the touch API. So you should not be relying on these uh, features alone. They should be add value-added features, so you still have traditional keyboard search, predictive text, uh, and make that all accessible, etc. So my colleague, Billy Gregory, has, has told me the story a few times uh, about a gentleman called Johnny Taylor. And Johnny, uh, like Sam, uh, was in a car accident and was paraplegic. Was paraplegic to, and, and he doesn't have um, the use of his voice or hands particularly, so he's, he's very much reliant on um, our iPad, etc. And Johnny was at a conference with Billy and a few other people, I think it was Accessibility Toronto coming up in September, quick plug, and they were talking around, um, you know, how do we know when something is accessible? And they were sort of kicking around the idea of definition of done and, and how we can measure success and all of this kind of, um, you know, smart stuff that we do. And Johnny just, uh, shared this by saying, well, how do we know when something is accessible? When I can use it. And that's just it. You know, we have our guidelines, we have compliance, that can be measured, that can be tested. But to all intents and purposes, until we know that the people out there can efficiently complete a task, submit a form, get to the TV show they want, that's when we know that something is truly, truly inclusive. So I would say to you, just, you know, do your testing, follow the guidelines, but take it back to the users. Include these principles in, in user research. Include these principles when you're actually designing your products. And think about people, our diverse users, and how, how they might be affected by your design decisions. Um, a quick thank you, although there's a lot of text on screen. Um, a thank you, obviously, to Leonie, Ian, and Hayden. But they've worked really hard on this over the last few months. We also sent this out to comments to a, a, an amazing bunch of people who gave us some really good comment, which pr pretty much everything has gone back into the guidelines or will be um, put back in after launch, so more images, etc. So a quick shout out to Jamie Knight, Chris Mills, Glenn Gorgon, Gordon, Marco Zahe, Ethan Marcotte, David Sloan, Melanie Richards, Tom Waterhouse, Matt Atkinson. Charles McCarthy Neville, Patrick Lauker, and Justin Stockton. You can have a look at the principles at www.inclusivedesignprinciples.org. Um, massive shout out to Charles McCarthy Neville because he's done a Spanish translation for us because this is about inclusion after all. We have a French one in the pipeline and we hope to get more out there as soon as we can. There's also a blog post going into uh, explaining the, the background to the guidelines, and these slides are linked to from the blog post on pasiellogroup.com. Finally, I just want to say thank you for tuning in, um, especially for those for whom it's very early or very late. Um, enjoy your coffee or your beer. Um, 
if you have questions, please do ask them over Twitter. We have a hashtag ID principles. So feel free to ask us over Twitter, but equally feel free to ask us on the blog. This is a, you know, design is ever evolving. So we, we hope to hear your experiences, get your examples and evolve these over time and, and improve them if possible. Thank you very much, Haney. Great stuff. That's all right. Thanks, Pat. That's okay. <laughs> so I think we've got time for questions, if there are any. Yeah, we looked over the, the Twitters, and I don't think there were any questions, but uh, David's got a question for you. Hi, Henny. There's, there's, uh, there's been plenty of great, great comments on Twitter. Um, I was wondering, there's, there's various other sort of resources and, and principles out there. Could you perhaps give a bit of background into how how the t these TPG principles are, are sort of built on on those other uh, inclusive design principles? Yeah. Um, so if you go to the blog post, uh, you'll see that we've we've linked to a few of other sort of resources and guidelines out there, like the Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit, which is amazing, a web for everyone, which is brilliant, accessible UX manifesto. There's there's many more as well. The, the the way the you know nothing nothing is original and nothing's kind of you know no you can never take credit for something solely and the, these are built on not just everything else that's out there but also built on you know feedback and work we've done with clients and equally with with feedback and work we've done with um, end users and user research and stuff um, these are not in competition too. We needed something that we, we could work from as a framework internally within TPG. So a lot of the work we do is what we call design, design reviews of teams when they're designing for a product and we assess their visual designs. So a little bit of what we do is check the color contrast, check for visible focus states, etc. But the majority of what we do is looking at the components, looking at their features and assessing how, you know, assessing them for feasibility. Can these be made um, accessible? Is there a better way of, of, of doing this? And we've been using these principles to help us uh, guide our thinking. And I, I for one, constantly uh, am asking myself, are there two ways we can do this seamlessly? Is this value added, etc.? And a lot of these principles I worked um, on at BBC, in fact, and if you go back to the BBC, how to design for accessibility, a few of them were kicked off there and evolved. So I guess it's part of the big, bigger fabric, but just, you know, they're here for us to use and we just wanted to share them and see if, if perhaps others would find them useful as well. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, Pat, have there been any more questions? Sorry, too many windows open. Uh, no, <laughs> not that I've seen, but I've just <laughs> tweeted out again the link to the website and the ID principles hashtag as well. So if anybody's got questions or suggestions, uh, have a look at that and uh, tweet away. Brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Henny. And for everybody who's uh, who's following ID24, we'll take a short 10-ish minute break and find us on the uh, next YouTube video stream. Uh, until then, see you in a minute. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.